One more circle. Oh my gosh, Phil. One more circle. <laughs> I'm late because I green commuted to church. <sighs> Hi. Oh, I'm sweaty. <sighs> How's everybody? What did I miss? <laughs> so what is green commute? What does that mean? Does anybody have an idea? I think it means coming in a bike or walking, carpool, uh, skateboard, um, scooter. Anybody come in any of those ways to church today? Reed did. Awesome. Brianna, you came in a carpool with your family. Yes, you did. <laughs> How about anybody? I really like this tricycle. I might stay on it all day. <laughs> it's Sean Ways. Um, anybody else? Do, do a green commute? How about folks who did a green commute to church stand up? Anybody bike? Yay! <clears throat> Well, it's so great. I feel so grateful to God to be part of a church that celebrates our beautiful earth and joining in in the UCC campaign for One Earth with our green commute today. And uh, after the service, there'll be lots of displays around in here to learn about green commute. And if you haven't already picked one up, we have these lanyards that say, mine doesn't say I tricycled today. It just says I biked today, but there's some that say I walked or I carpooled, but I'm mostly grateful to God for this great, big, beautiful world that we live in and that we get to take care of and be good stewards of. So um, thank you for all the ways you came to church today. We're so glad that you're here. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word and God will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is the, from God who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Creator will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to God, because God is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Jesus answered him, those who love me will keep my word, and God will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is the, from God who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Creator will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to God, because God is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Laura has just read to us from John, and it's known uh, by those of us who uh, study the Bible as the farewell discourse. I think it's an amazing uh, scripture for us this morning. We've moved now from, I think, those first days of Easter and the celebration of Easter and what Easter means to us to facing into Pentecost. So we are over the halfway mark as we move now through the 50 days of Easter and uh, on towards Pentecost. So when this text was written, it was probably 70, maybe even 80 years after Jesus' death. 
It's attributed to a disciple named John, but most likely it was not the beloved disciple. It was a disciple of the beloved disciple who uh, received the words and the experience from the disciple and now was sharing those words in community. So in this text, we see perhaps one generation removed from the actual experience with Jesus, but there is a memory in this text of who he is and what he meant in community. So I'd like to imagine this text as Jesus as a mother. We hear so much about the father in this text, but Jesus as a mother, standing with her hand on the door of the house, a coat over her arm, looking at her children as she gets ready to leave. The children are on the floor playing with Legos or perhaps cell phones. And as she gets ready to leave, one of them looks up and suddenly realizes and gets it. Oh, my goodness, mom's going. And says, where are you going? Will you be gone very long? Will you take me with you? Who's going to take care of us while you're gone? This image, I think, of the mother at the doorknob gets at the heart of our scripture. In this farewell discourse, Jesus is a uh, preparing for the ascension and the ascension actually is this Thursday so he's getting ready to go while his followers are barely able to grasp that he has come back that he's been resurrected never mind getting ready to go again we're in this amazing season I think of resurrection return and remembrance another way to describe this season would be separation and departure. At this critical juncture, we must learn and we must know how to trust God. We must trust in God to reopen within us those very deep and tender places to make room for the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Divine Comforter to move and to work within us again. It's also the season of the re's, R-E apostrophe S. It's a tiny Latin prefix that means simply to go back, to do again. There are a lot of re's in this morning's text and a lot of re's in this season. Remind, remember, rejoice, all part of this morning's text. And there are a lot of re's that we're talking about in this season. Remembrance, return, redeem, reconcile, even resurrection. All are e's. The re's represent our hope, each in its own way, that no matter how far we move from a deeply whole life, we always can return. We can always find our way back again, return. Our text this morning is a re-text, reminding us and Jesus' followers that even as Jesus departs, God will come again, and God will be with us in the form and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Eric Cobell has written a tiny book called The God of Second Chances. In that book, he writes that we follow God who always gives us another chance at things. I think this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, I'm going away, but I'm coming again. You get another chance, and the Holy Spirit will make everything plain to you. So as you open yourself up to getting this second chance, guess who's going to be? with you. If we don't get it the first time, there's a really good chance that we might get it the second time. And for those of us who are more dense, a few more times after that, we always get another chance. Well, I had a second chance the other day that I want to share with the congregation, and I'm so glad that Emma Jean's here this morning, uh, and anyone else who is related to part of our church in this special way. So I went to the dry cleaners to pick up my um, dry cleaning. And as I parked in front of the dry cleaners, I put my nickel in the meter four minutes. Don't you think that's enough to pick up your dry cleaning? No, says Kathy. Well, <laughs> I went in, 
picked up my dry cleaning and was just getting ready to pay, and two beloved parishioners walked in. They'd seen me walk into the dry cleaners and said, Hi, how are you? Well, we just got back from here, and we want to talk to you about this. And so we sat and we talked for 10 minutes. It was great. It was a wonderful time. I completely forgot about the meter, turned around, paid for my dry cleaning, and came out. And you know who was there and what was happening. So I just looked at her at the meter maid and I said, oh no, please, oh no, <laughs> I don't want to get a ticket. And well, lady, it's been seven minutes and I came here and left, I gave you a chance and was going to come back again. And now here I'm going to come back again. And I, now here I am and I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> honestly, honestly, without guile, I know what you all are thinking, it was a plot. I'm a pastor, I've just been talking to my parishioners, please don't give me a ticket, please. And this lovely woman looks at the ticket and says, blessed is he, blessed is the one, blessed are you who do God's work on Jesus' behalf. And I walked up to her and we just started talking and I said, what church do you belong to? Well, I go to Church of the Regeneration in Oakland and well, I, I'm a minister of First Congregational Church of Berkeley, a very blank look. And, and we kept talking, and it was this kind of wonderful, powerful moment between us, and I could just feel the energy rise and rise and rise. And then she says to me, well, what church do you, are you pastor of? I might just come to worship. i got to check to see if she's here today. <laughs> she's not. I might just come to worship sometime. And I said, well, you know, it's at the corner of Durant and Channing Way and Dana, and this wonderful woman says, well, I know that church. I shop at the Cellar Thrift Shop. <laughs> and then she said, and then she said, I'm not going to give you a ticket, but please put 35 cents in the meter. <laughs> God gives a second chance. Isn't that a great story? Well, I have another story for you this morning, and it's in contrast, but this past Wednesday, I was uh, so blessed and so privileged to be at a women's leadership event uh, in New York City, actually, with 500 uh, women from around New York City, and I guess from around the country, because I was there. And at that event, three women spoke, and I want to tell you about the second woman who spoke, Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth. I don't know how many of you have followed her story and her life. She uh, is from the 8th District of Illinois. She is a congresswoman. She's a most remarkable human being. And as she came forth to the podium uh, to talk about her life, everyone in the place uh, was quiet. She was raised as a daughter of a United Nations administrator, so Tammy got to live all over the world, grew up in a global setting, but military service was very deep in her history and very deep in her family's uh, origin. Highly trained and very specialized, she signed up for the Iraq War. And as she made her way to the podium and struggled to come from her wheelchair to the uh, podium, I saw what serving in that war, we all saw what serving in that war had cost her. She's lost both legs, one leg above the hip, one leg just above the knee, and the use of her arm in a helicopter crash. She was amazing. She spoke from the podium of the grace that is present in her life and was present in her life each moment of her life, even when she couldn't feel it, couldn't see it, and didn't want to know it, resisted that grace, that grace was present in her. She spoke of being at Walter Reed after the crash with many other amputees and the courage that she received from those who surrounded her, people lifting her up and saying, you can do this. And she spoke so eloquently of the second chance at life she received through the grace of her fellow Black Hawk pilot. She was a helicopter pilot, a Black Hawk pilot, as the helicopter crashed, uh, the pilots, other co-pilots could look and see that she appeared to them to be dead and uh, separated from her uh, limbs and they could have left her. They had to escape, they had to run out. And instead they lifted her up and lifted her out and risked their own lives to take her to safety. She said that to be able to run for Congress in Illinois and to win 
It's just another way for her to return, return, and to give back to the world and to those who saved her life. She spoke with incredible strength and raw courage, and I see and saw the God of second chances shining in her life, in her life story. It was kind of funny, uh, after the uh, speech, I was in the women's room when she arrived in the women's room, and she came in in her wheelchair, and it was kind of a, uh, a beautiful moment. All the women in the room just gathered around her. They wanted some of her grace and some of her energy, but there was also laughter because we looked down and one of her prosthetic legs, uh, she's decorated in red, white, and blue with stars. It was a grace-filled moment. Second chances, I think, in our life are everywhere. Second chances in our life everywhere. We all get a second chance at the things that we need to get second chances at. I think this morning that thanks to the hunger strike going on at Guantanamo Bay, Barack Obama and other leaders have a chance to get it right this time and close it down. I think that maybe our good earth, our sweet, dear, precious, good earth is getting an another chance at survival because of efforts like people like Rachel who want to bike to work and who want to care for the earth. I think that's going to make a difference. Even the littlest thing will make a difference in the history and life of our earth. And the NRA is holding its annual convention in Houston this morning and this weekend but outside of their doors are the parents and victims of gun violence pleading with them to reconsider and also already at work on another chance for Congress to get it right as we move into the next election cycle, a second chance. I'm sure that every grown-up person in this room is aware of the second chances you've received at life and at something important for you and maybe some of our children have received second chances as well. When was the last time someone forgave you and you were freed up to move on? You got a second chance. When has someone picked you up when you were all but lost and carried to safety? You got a second chance. Has someone been willing to return for you? Has someone come back for you? you have a second chance. I think second chances arrive with the awful grace of God and in the willingness of those around us to rescue us when we have crashed and burned and maybe aren't able to lift ourselves up on our own. I think Jesus understood second chances better than most of us. He preached about it and he taught about it in parables and stories. Think of the Good Samaritan. A lot of second chances there. Think of the prodigal son and even the story of the raising of Lazarus. Lazar Lazarus got a second chance at life. I think our faith is a second chance faith. And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing because not all of us are good at getting it the first time. So in this season of separation and departure, we arrive at a critical junction which m where we must learn how to trust God, to reopen the tender places in us, to make room in our hearts for the Holy Spirit to move into our life, into our community, into the world, giving us another chance at getting it. Let us make room for reopening in our bodies and lives what is closed, remembering in your life what has been forgotten, remaking our longing for something new. That's what the Holy Spirit helps us with to take place among and within us. And let us rejoice in the Holy Spirit's wisdom to provide us with boundless energy, rekindling our deep desire for healing and peace. Jesus said those beautiful words in this text, I'm going away, but I'm returning again. 
and I will send the Holy Spirit to comfort you and to be with you. Amen. I think one more bicycle will ascend when I am reading scripture today. (laughs) So this is out of the Gospel of John, our, our Christian scripture reading. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and God will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from God who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Creator will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to God, because God is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. May God bless these words and our hearing of them. I was at a meeting of some church folks a little while ago. Nobody from this church, but folks from a few different congregations Churches that had decided to gather on a monthly basis to offer support and guidance to one another. One congregation, a regular part of the group, was not in attendance on that night. And as people have a tendency to do, even church folks, we began to talk about the congregation that was absent (laughs) and its pastor. We began to gossip. Because I am not a regular member of this group, the others went to some effort to fill me in on the trials and tribulations of this particular congregation. Trials and tribulations that had had the effect of cutting the size of the congregation in half once, and then cutting it in half once again. Trials and tribulations which had left the congregation with no more than four dedicated souls that it can still count as members. Trials and tribulations which, according to these church folks, were largely the fault of the pastor. After recounting these woes of this congregation, one person at the meeting remarked, but you should hear that pastor tell it. As he sees it, he's the glue that's holding that congregation together. Recalling the several splits of the congregation, I thought to myself, as glue goes, he is not terribly adhesive. (laughs) It's certainly not glue of the super variety. (laughs) And just as I was thinking this, the woman to my left, one of the church folks, she raised her head just a little, and she looked up at me as she said something that I've been unable to forget ever since. That's right, him. He's what's holding the congregation together. Not God. Him. It it blew me away. Not God. Him. I was simply unprepared for God to be brought into that conversation in that genuine of a way. Now, I know I ought to expect God to be a subject of conversation at a gathering of church folks. And of course, God is usually mentioned at such meetings, but not like this. In my experience, what we usually do at church meetings is discuss church business, what needs to be done, who is going to do it, and how we are going to pay for it. Now, I believe that God is present at those meetings But apart from a prayer tacked on at the end, 
this belief is mostly the result of my faith. And you know what faith is, don't you? Why, it's, it's a belief in things unseen. But this woman, Deborah is her name, was talking about God like it mattered. Like it was what we should be talking about. While we were all engaged in the ways of the world, gossiping about our friends and colleagues, Deborah reminded us that God is not of this world. You see, we had been guilty of the same sin as the pastor we were talking about. All of us were seeking to explain the fate of that congregation by talking about what the pastor had done. Not a single one of us was thinking about what God was doing in that congregation. None of us were really trying to discern where God was calling that congregation to be. So wrapped up in the world that we almost forgot that we were called by God. You know how it is, don't you? I mean, it, it's never an intentional thing. It always starts out with the best of intentions. There is something just so good or just so bad that you have to share it with someone. You have to let people know about this thing and you need to get right to work on fixing the problem. We've been polluting our world. There's a hole in the ozone. Greenhouse gases are warming the planet. We've got to do something. And so we put together a plan, what we're going to do, how we're going to publicize it, and we have a mission for one Earth. We have hours to count. We have trees to plant and letters to send. And we have friends to best in competition for these hours, trees, and letters. We have other churches whom we can better in our competition. And when it's all done, we will have all the hours, trees, and letters counted for the whole denomination, and we will know that we are the best of all denominations, and that we have solved the world's problems. In this mission for One Earth, we hear a lot about One Earth, a lot about One Humanity, but sometimes it's hard to hear much about the One God. Although I do think that white people, like myself, especially liberals, like myself, struggle with their desire to save the world, I don't mean to pick on us or on our denomination this morning. This problem of getting wrapped up in the world is something that happens to all Christians. In fact, it is so prevalent that Jesus and the God he called Father came up with a plan to deal with just this situation. Their plan was the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was once described to me by a wise man, our very own Ken Iha, as God in the present tense. If God, the mother or father or creator or whatever we wish to call her is too remote for you, if you weren't lucky enough to be there for one of those resurrection appearances, then the Holy Spirit is just the thing for you. It is God with us here and now. But most importantly, it is a gift. A gift given of God to us. As such, it is not something that we own, it is not something that we master. It is not a possession of ours which we may give to others. These things, ownership, dominance, and possession, are things that belong to the ways of the world. And as Jesus tells us, the peace of this spirit is peace not like the world gives. This Holy Spirit, an advocate sent to us of God, is to teach us to guide us, to remind us of the ways of Jesus. And that must be our orientation to the Spirit, one of a humble student and disciple. To submit to being a student, not for a short while, 
but forever. To voluntarily humble ourselves and to follow something that we cannot fully know or ever remotely control, these are not the ways of the world. These are the ways of the Spirit. I have a story that I'd like to share with you. And it's a story that was told to me by a professor of mine who comes from South Africa. I believe I've mentioned him to you before from this pulpit. But he's just one of those professors that I don't think I'll ever forget. Professor West, Gerald West, runs the Ujamaa Center in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. And the Ujamaa Center conducts a special kind of Bible study. It's called the Contextual Bible Study. And they do it with rural and impoverished African communities. In these Bible studies, the goal is to bring forth the knowledge and the theologies of the participants, to allow biblical scholars like Professor West to learn from this knowledge, and to help the communities put their theology and knowledge to work in their own context. It may sound simple, but trust me, getting biblical scholars to seriously listen to and appreciate the contributions of poor, uneducated, often sick villagers is a remarkable feat. Anyways, Professor West once told me a story of going to a remote village to assist with a Bible study. He and his colleagues arrived at the village. They met with the people and together they studied the Bible. They learned from one another. It is slow going because there are multiple languages being spoken and few of the participants can read in any language. But they stay at it for a long time. And at the end of the Bible study, an old man from the village takes Professor West by the arm and asks to speak with him. He explains that the people in the village must walk two miles for clean water, which they carry back in buckets. As he is explaining this, he is walking Professor West to the top of a hill where there stands a solitary water bottle. The old man tells Professor West that three years ago, a group of white people came to the village in large black SUVs. When they saw the people bringing water from so far away, they decided that what was needed was a water pump. And so they returned with surveying equipment. They surveyed the land and decided on the ideal location for the water pump. They installed the pump on the top of this hill, and no one has ever used it. This last comment startled my professor, and he asked why no one uses it. Does it not work? I don't know, the old man replied. We've never tried it, because this hill is where we bury our ancestors. It is sacred ground to us, and we do not come here. At that point, the old man stretched forth his hand and shook the hand of my professor. I want to thank you for listening to us. I want to thank you for listening to us. It was a small thing that Gerald West and the Ujamaa Center did for that village. They didn't solve their water problem. They left behind no world-changing technology, but they listened. They did not assume that they knew the answer. They went to that village seeking to learn they went to that village as humble disciples eager to hear what the Spirit had to share with them in this place and through these people. Their humility, their frank desire to, loom, to learn made room for the Holy Spirit. It allowed the Spirit to move through the villagers and into them in a way that simply isn't possible when we are sure that we already know the answer. When we hear of the impending environmental disaster, the last thing that we want to do is wait. 
We want to take action. We want to solve the problem. But we are only human. We are limited and finite. The solutions to the problems of the world are not things that we know and possess and can enact flawlessly on our own. But we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. When our hearts become troubled and we become afraid, we know that the answer is not to jump into action, but to wait, to listen for the Spirit, which gives a peace that is not of this world. Because if the problems of this world are to be solved, the solution may need to come from somewhere else. So as we continue this mission for one earth, let us remember that this mission is not ours. It is God's mission. Let us consider who we might not be listening to. Who can we learn from? Where is the Holy Spirit working amongst us, and how can we be open to it? But most of all, let us remember that we are called by God, not to be wrapped up in the things of this world, but to wait, to listen humbly, and to accept the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen.